What's up, guys? So you guys come out on a Thursday night to read God's Word, huh? How many guys are you, man? Jesus freaks. Amen. Yeah, we need some Jesus freaks around these days, man. Too many other freaks out there. Yep, we're in those days. I can't help to think about it more. I We uh, had a pastor's uh, conference this week um, at Costa Mesa. It was the, the annual uh, senior pastor's conference. And one cool thing about Pastor Jeff is he always gets his associate pastors invited. And so we get an opportunity to go and kind of hear and receive what all the senior pastors from Calvary Chapels all throughout the U.S. and internationally are receiving. And it's pretty neat to be a part of that. I think it's pretty cool. Um, and to just see what the Lord is speaking uh, to the churches today, at least the churches that we're part of, because we are part of Calvary Chapel. Um, and, you know, and to just meet a lot of the bros and see what the Lord's doing in their lives. And what's really neat is just to hear some testimonies of some of these guys and to see uh, how God uh, can, what God has done through Calvary Chapel, you know what I mean? And uh, one, of the, one of the talks was pretty neat because they had a professor there and uh, he kind of gets up with all his professional, his professionalism and professor type stuff and all the guy did was knock seminaries the whole time. And he just kind of was like from that uh, environment and just said to the Calvary Chapel pastors how, how thwarted the educational institution in terms of theology has become today. And he, you know, and he was a little radical, I'd have to say, you know, I don't mind radical, you know, it's kind of cool with me. Uh, but he was real radical in terms of his being real staunch against what the, a lot of the theological seminaries and different universities that teach theology are kind of getting into. And he gave a real neat explanation on how the word of God is being so softened today and it's being so pieced apart. And the different truths of the Bible that we hold as truth are being, you know, interpreted as something that is not true. Uh, he gave examples of like the scripture that where uh, if I was to ask you guys, hey, you know, that scripture where Jesus put a coin in that one fish's mouth and who wasn't that one and got it? Matthew. Wasn't it? Who was it? Matthew. Was it Matthew or was it Peter? Peter? Peter, I think one of them. They went and got it. And, and we believe that scripture to be true. And we read that and we search for application in it and we say Jesus did miracles like that. But he was giving examples like all that stuff today is being taught on a whole nother scale. It's just figurative. It's just an analogy. It's just uh it's just a, a, like a tale of some sort to, to represent other meanings. And that's the type of thing and that's being taught today in a lot of the universities and, and Christian uh, theological seminaries. And I thought that was interesting just to show more of the confirmation of where we're going today in our society. And where our, even our Christian, uh, sort of if I had to say our social Christian environment is going down that same road as far as uh, loosening up what we know to be true. But the, but the Bible teaches that. Jesus said, uh, he, he taught about shepherds coming, uh, that they're not going to feed his flock. He taught about uh, all these different things that we, we've, we've studied for so long. And so it's kind of a trip to see it coming to pass, you know, uh, to see it happening on a large scale and not just, a, not just a, what we used to think of, oh, it, it's just a denominational thing. You know, that denomination is crazy, you know. Now it's everywhere. It's even in non-denominational organizations or churches. So what a trip, man. And, uh, but there was a lot more than just him bashing, you know, churches. It was uh, a lot of the fear of the Lord, talks on fear of the Lord, talks about worshiping the Lord. Uh, and not, and the, not just meaning worshiping like what we just did, that is a form of worship, but also just worshiping the Lord in your life. You know, is your life worshiping God? Uh, do you... Uh, in, in, in your house, in your own everyday life, turn to worship God to some degree in, in everything that you do. And I thought that was a heavy conversation. I started to think about my house, you know, like, do I, am I, am I get, getting my kids and my wife to worship God? You know, not just singing, but to worship Him. Uh, but we are to provide avenues of worship for all those that are in our lives. And are we doing that? Do we do that? Do we as men? And as husbands or as, as friends or as 
coworkers, do we do that? Do we provide uh, in your life testimony avenues for people to say, hey, I want to be able to worship the God you worship too because of what I'm seeing in your life? And are we providing that? You know, And so a lot of different cool things um, that we're, we're being taught. And as you can imagine, much more. And you guys, if you're interested in hearing some of these talks, they do, they do keep it uh, available on the Costa Mesa website. You know, I think they abbreviated it. I don't know these hashtag things. I'm not into all that, but hashtag uh, CC, Calvary Chapel, SP, Senior Pastor, you know, Conference 2015 or something like that. So I probably ruined that, but it's something like that. You get what I'm trying to say. Uh, so you can check it out and check out all the different talks. It's pretty cool. Uh, so with that said, uh, I was thinking a lot about uh, this study this week. I was thinking a lot about our men's study and just about the ministries that we have that come out of the men's study. And I know that's why uh, Oscar, when he's announcing a lot of these things, uh, it's because it's because of the work that I that I believe. And I know many of you guys believe that God has done through the men's ministry. How many of you guys have been around the men's ministry for at least five years? Some of you, some of you, come on, some, a couple of you guys old school guys, huh? Uh, and, you know, you'll, you'll see for those of you guys who've been around here. For at least five, how about 10 years? Yeah, like you guys remember 10 years ago. <laughs> and uh, so 10 years ago, the study, and, and throughout the years, uh, the men's study has changed. It has changed, as I think any ministry should change. Any ministry should have, whether it's growth in numbers or growth in its, in its spirituality, and in its in-depth, you know. Uh, and so we, as a men's ministry, have grown, uh, both in, in size and in our activity and involvement in the church. And I think that's fruitful. And my prayer is that we would continue to, to not necessarily grow in, in numbers, but that we would grow as strong brothers together. We would get to know one another, we'd be involved in each other's lives, and we'd be involved in the church. Because ultimately we are essential to the body of Christ. And so I did a lot of thinking about the men's study this last week, and I always kind of do, I always reflect and try to hear from the Lord as to what he would have me do here in the men's study. And I think one of the, one of the biggest things I always hear loud is, uh, number one, first and most foremost, teach the word. And, to, and for all of us, to not only receive the word, but to teach it to the people that are in your life. Teach the word, always, in and out of season. Uh, I always like, if you hang out with me, like I know Jeremiah and I hang out a lot, and we, it's all of a sudden like, Bible trivia, here we go, answer this question. You know, it's like, we got to keep each other sharp, man. Let's keep ourselves in the word, keep ourselves in the knowledge of it. But then most importantly, uh, and not most importantly, but as equal as important to live it out. Live it out in action. Be a part of the body of Christ. Be, lead, you know. Um, even if it's here in this setting or if it's in other ministries like Oscar does the ushers, which is kind of like a men's ministry, kind of. But, you know, Oscar, he, he's, he used to serve in the men's study. Uh, all the time, and now he does ushers any chance he gets. But even in the ushers ministry and all the ministries that we have here in New Hope, uh, the different parts we can get involved in, man, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what's going to come forth from this ministry, and I believe that's what God showed me as we continue to study his word and worship him. And so I was thinking, too, about the scripture we're in in Samuel. It's been pretty neat come, going through First and Second Samuel. Um, a lot of heavy things have come out of it. And I don't exactly know where we're going to go after Samuel. Maybe we'll just go back to 1 Samuel. You know what I mean? And just do that again. <laughs> uh, but we'll see what the Lord's going to do after we finish this book. But um, so let's pray, guys, as we get into the word and just pray that the Lord would minister to us and that he would show us individually um, what it is he's calling you to do, what it is he has for you in your life, and how you can get involved and how you can serve him until he comes. And so, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, just saving us from the place that we were at. And, Lord, whether we've been here for 10 years, 5 years, or a couple of years, Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us direction for our lives. Lord, we want to know how to please you in this life. We want to know how to serve you and how to be a blessing to those around us, how to love our wives, how to love our children. And, Lord, how to be there for brothers uh, in times of need. So, Lord, we ask all of this from you because we can't do it within ourselves. Lord, help us to not see, uh, despise the day of small beginnings. Lord, but help us to know that any work that you've begun in our lives, that you're going to be faithful to complete it. 
And so, Lord, we commit our hands and our eyes and our ears and our minds to you tonight. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 2 Samuel chapter 20 is where we left off. 2 Samuel chapter 20. Uh, I don't know how far we're going to get into this thing tonight. Uh, how many of you guys read the whole thing? Chapter 20. Okay, how many of you guys read one verse? Okay, so, okay, okay we're on the same page, bro. Uh, and uh, 2 Samuel chapter 20, it's heavy. We're, 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 as we all know, we're, we're going through this this book and we're going through the life of David and we're just experiencing with him many of the things that are life-changing for him. Life-changing events, man. Wilderness experiences. And I know I keep saying that over and over. But here now, where we left off last week was now David has come to the place of restoration in terms of coming back from the wilderness. Uh, along the way, as we've been seeing, he's been uh, kind of reconciling things with people that kind of dogged him on his way out. And we see that, that now that he's kind of come close to the palace, to the place that God has called him, the guys started breaking out in an argument. Israel and Judah. The two people groups started just getting on each other. Who knows David more? Now that David's coming back to being king, I know him more than you, bro. He's my brother, and you're his cousin. You know, I'm closer to him. Uh, we also saw an example. You guys remember Barzillai, the faithful brother who was consistent. And so last week we talked a lot about consistency versus inconsistency, or being real fickle, or being just real phony. How about that? And so we saw that last week, the two differences, and I think... We're challenged in putting ourselves in one of those positions. <laughs> are we a faithful person? Are we consistent in our walk? Or are we just all over the place in our walk? But you see, eventually, that type of Christianity has its day. That type of relationship has its time. And as anything, right? I mean, you reap to what you sow. Uh, you know, when there's a bunch of clouds, it starts to rain. It's the same thing. Eventually, something comes out. And so when, when you see two people groups going at each other's necks, eventually what's going to happen? Either they're going to duke it out, wipe everybody, everybody's going to kill each other, at least in the Old Testament, or there's going to be a separation or division. And that's what the, sh the foreshadowing of last week was. The quarrel that was taking place between Judah and Israel was only a foreshadowing of a division waiting to come. So we start off this next chapter as like, what happens? Who, who are the people that pop up into play when a division is on the move? Now, a lot of you guys have probably seen this true in your own life. A lot of us have probably seen these types of things happening where you see a quarrel begin. You see two people groups arguing. See, how about politicians? You see two political parties at odds with one another. Eventually, someone is going to come on the scene and join into that sort of negativity. And so that's kind of how we start off today's chapter. We start off with a scene of David probably putting his head down. It's funny, walking out with his head down and then probably walking in a little bit excited and then putting his head down again. Just going, what did I get myself back into? The palace is a mess. This calling is a mess. All it comes with is division and strife. And so now we pick up here in chapter 20, verse 1, and it says, And there happened to be there a man of Beli Ael, or Beli Ael. I want to stop on that word for a second. I think it's important that we understand this, what this word means. Um, this word is, at first glance, looks like it's describing some kind of tribe or some kind of, uh, you know, people group, as the Bible usually does. But it's interesting because over in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 13, it, it kind of gives us a, a, a backdrop of what this word means. It says in verse 13 of chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. 
This right here in Deuteronomy 13 is the first occurrence of that word, Belial. The first time it appears in the Bible. And it's interesting because what it's denoting is it denotes all that is wicked. And it implies a person of an instigator. Uh, somebody who is going to be divisive at heart. You see, right off the top, it says, it describes these people as being, saying, let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known. And it talks about them, look at in this verse, about them going out and withdraw, uh, drawing out people, going into the city, going into the people, bringing them out from among them. So the, what's implied about these people of Belial is that they go into places, they go into cities, they go into people groups, they withdraw the, the people, Okay, and then they give them reason to withdraw. And they say, come out, let's go do something different than what's happening here. Let's go serve other gods, you know. Let's go get involved in idolatry. So the, the picture that we have of this people group now is of a people group who are just out for no good. And what the word actually means in definition is a worthless, uh, useless, and antagonizing or interrogation. So this word defines a not good person. <laughs> Somebody who is out to just do the most wicked thing you can do. And that wicked, useless, antagonizing person is out to do one thing, and that is to divide for their own agenda and their own motive. That's what these people of Belial do in the Bible. So right now, David's in a scene where there's already some upheaval taking place between Judah and Israel. And then on the scene comes a person who is worthless, useless, and out to antagonize and separate. Well, where'd he come from? Funny though, isn't it? In situations like this, where there is heat on the rise, you find those people that are there to do only one thing, and that is to cause more harm. It's interesting how the Bible shows us the picture of these types of people coming on these types of scenes. Why? Because you might find that very true of your own life. Funny how the enemy is out to divide and to split up families, to split up your mind. How about that? Let's just start there and then we'll work our way down. The rest of the life, okay? So let's just start from our minds. Uh, if the enemy can divide your mind, as I always say, and the Bible says, what's that? Scripture. Uh, if, if you're divided, a house that's divided will not stand. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So what do you think the enemy's going to try to do first in your mind? <laughs> He's going to try to split it right now. Divide. Cause you to be double-minded. And what's wild about that, and true, most of us can testify of, when we begin to get split sometimes in our mind, here comes that Belial somewhere. That one who's ready to antagonize you and interrogate you and be so worthless and useless to you. You see, guys, how do we identify when we're finding ourselves in a split mode? Well, you identify it by, are there people coming to you that are just absolutely useless and worthless? And you, feel, you just feel the pressure of division. Man, you're struggling. What should I do, bro? I'm on this side or I'm on that side. I'm struggling with some thoughts right now. And then you got that one person that just wants to push you right on over the edge. Not to the good side either. Just to, just to get you mad, you know. Even a Christian. Just to say the right verse that's going to just smack you in the face. Oh, you're really struggling? Well, you know what the Bible says, man. And he gives you a verse that just completely destroys your heart. It doesn't encourage you whatsoever. You see, the enemy's very crafty, man. Very tricky. Guys, we have to know when we're under attack. And we have to know the directions that the attacks are coming from. It's for those of you who are involved in ministry, mostly. Or for those of you who are really loving God's word. That, that's, that's you. You are the one right now where there's a Belial knocking at your door, ready to be worthless and useless to you, and only to antagonize and to make the situation worse. It'll come in the form of a person, a woman, okay, or a situation at work, or any, he comes in all these different forms, but he comes in this way, uh, almost of a spiritual deception. A lot of times pastors talk about the Jezebel spirit, and I'm not gonna get weird about it. Uh, you know, I don't know how do we classify demons or whatever. Demons are demons, okay? Satan is Satan. 
uh, and it's all, in my opinion, wrecked up. But some people talk about the Jezebel spirit. The Jezebel spirit is the, the woman Jezebel who is just this wicked girl in the scripture. All right. She just she threw the dude off the, the second story. The dogs drink his blood and all this stuff. I mean, I think it was her. And she just completely chased off. What's his name? Isaiah. Was it that? Isaiah chased him off. And she just the Jezebel spirit is one that is selfish, one that has her own motive, one that wants to murder, one that wants to just gain for her own reason. So I've always been kind of like when people say, oh, you have to, that, that, that one has a Jezebel spirit. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, like, how about that person just messed up, you know? But yeah, probably the Jezebel spirit. And the reason why I talk about it here is because it's the same concept with Belial. The, the spirit of Belial. The spirit of one who is divisive, one who wants to interrogate, one who has nothing good to offer somebody when they're down, one who just has nothing but uh, their own agenda. And it's funny because when we talk about people like that, you start to almost sometimes see yourself in the mirror and go, Oh man, you know what? I kind of was like that too. I should have been encouraging that brother. Instead, I was over there just antagonizing it, you know, <laughs> laughing at it in my own heart, saying jokes that made him cry. You know, look, I got him crying. And then you feel all bad afterward. Oh, I'm sorry, man. But you did. You see, the Jezebel and the Belial spirit, let's just call it that. I'm not, I'm not creating some doctrine here, okay? But let's just call it an influence. How about that? A spiritual influence that can get into every single one of us if we are not sensitive to God's word, sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and hearing him and saying, knock it off. We each can be divisive towards one another. And we too sometimes will see a situation like this guy we're going to talk about where there's already heat on the move and we want to get in there and make it worse. Man, how about we just start doing other things like edifying one another? How about if we just took on the image of Christ and said, you know what? How about I just want to love my brother? Because it supposedly said that they will know me by my love that I have for my brother. <clears throat> they will know me. They will know that I'm a Christian by the love that I have for my brother. That's what the Bible says. And so we have to ask ourselves, how much are we loving one another? How much are we edifying and encouraging one another? Are we doing and spending more time beating each other down? Camping on each other's weaknesses. Because if we are, we're entering into a world that we don't want to get into. You're entering into a place where you will find yourself weakening, you see. It could be fun and games. It's all fun and games until, you know, someone gets hurt, right? And it could be fun and games until you find yourself actually partaking of an apple that creates you to be bitter. And you start becoming a bitter person. And you start looking around, well, what happened? I used to be really cool. I make people laugh. Now I make people cry and everybody hates me. And I'm Christian. How about that? You see, what ends up happening, guys, is we start to partake of this type of spiritual influence in pieces gradually. And then eventually, it's who you become. You can become a Christian who is divisive. You, be, you can become somebody who is classified as a Christian and used by the enemy. We have to be careful. That's what these warnings are for. That's why we get to learn about things and influences like this. So, Belial, okay, the people group, the spiritual influence. But that's not what this brother's name is. His name was Sheba. And he was a Benjamite. So now we have what his name is. You see, that's why it's, it's not the people group that he's from. He's actually from the tribe of Benjamin. So he's being classified as this spiritual or this name that occurred in Deuteronomy. You see, because that's the kind of influence he has behind him. But his name is Sheba, and he's a Benjamite. He's not a son of Belial or, or from the tribe of Belial. It's just who he is outwardly as a person. Isn't that interesting? That his identity was one who was worthless and useless. That's how he's ID'd. But he's really from the, uh, the tribe of Benjamin. And look what he does. He blows a trumpet, it says. That word trumpet there in the original is the shofar. He blows a shofar, okay? Why would he blow a shofar? <laughs> okay, see, it's interesting that these types of influences, they want so much attention. <laughs> That's really what they're really searching for too, by the way. They want the attention. They want to draw everybody's eyes towards them. They're selfish that way. You see, Sheba 
He gets how to move the crowd. He understands how to do it. He's an influential guy. He'd probably been a politician today. Made his way up there real high. You see, even though his motive and his agenda are very spiritual deceiving, he knows how to influence the crowd practically. And he knows how to draw people to himself. You see, because that's what this type of influence does. He blows a shofar. A shofar is a trumpet. It's the sound of war. It's the sound of warning. It's what the watchmen would blow on, on top of the, the wall to warn people that the enemy was coming or to, to shout out that something major is happening here. That's what the shofar was for. But he's using it for his own agenda. How often, sometimes, do we see a temptation to use these things for our own agenda? You see, the shofar was meant to warn. So was the word of God. The word of God is meant to warn. The shofar was meant to, to draw attention for, for the city to, to see something. So is the word of God. The word of God is meant to draw attention. You see, but depending on the spiritual influence behind it is going to depend on really what it's being drawn for. Why do we blow our shofars? Why is it that we blow the word of God out loud? Are we in it for our own agenda? Are we in it for our own purpose? Do we blow the horn because we are, we are trying to make a selfish point? It's funny, man, to see how these things work. And when you start to really look into it, it's funny how you see yourself tempted to even do these things sometimes. Are you a Bible thumper for your own glory? You know, it's funny because the Bible, man, is meant, yes, it's meant to warn. It's meant to, to, to rebuke, definitely. But all of that said, it's meant to direct people's eyes to worship the Lord. And it's meant to direct people's eyes to see who God is and his grace. You see, I'm not softening up rebuke. But what leads to repentance is God's grace and his mercy. Not the shouting of beating down. And I'm not even trying to create some message because of the time that we're in today. As far as what we see happening with the agendas around us. We need to blow our own loud, loud and clear on what the Bible says. But we have to know, even with that, it's followed by his love and his mercy and his grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds that much more, you see. We live in a time where there's so much sin, sin all around us. It's everywhere in our nation. But be comforted then. If that's how much sin is around, then guess what? There's more grace than that. Where's the grace? How about even in our own lives? My wife's a sinner, bro. You don't even know. Well, amen. <laughs> but then grace should abound that much more. You see. So he's blowing the trumpet, this Sheba. And look at what he now he's going to do here. He says, we have no part in David. We have no part in David. Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. See, the, the debate was between Judah and Israel. Remember, we are all, I more, got more David than you. I got more David than you. I'm more of a family member than him. And Sheba just comes out and has all the answers for everybody. He says, how about I have no part in anything here? Well, then why are you blowing the horn, Sheba? <laughs> That's what I'd be saying. See, so now we have a third party argument here. And he says, I have no part in the son of Jesse. How about this? Every man to his tent. Oh, Israel. He's saying, I got the answer. I'm not going to argue about how much David I got in my bloodline. How about forget David and let's just all go do our own thing. Our own tent, Israel. Come on. And he directs Israel. Why? Because look at in verse 43 of the last chapter. The last, basically the last verse of what we read last week. What does it say about Israel? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, we have ten parts in the king. So they're arguing again on how much David they have. We also have more right in David than ye. Why then did he despise us that our advice should not be first had in bringing back our king? And the words, now watch this, and the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So Israel lost their little debate they were having. So who does he go to? Who does he direct? Sheba directs Israel. He says, he says, oh, oh, Israel got, they lost their debate. So I'm going to go direct Israel. I'm going to forget Judah. They obviously are standing strong up there like, yeah, we won that. So he's not talking to Judah. He's talking to Israel. Huh, Israel, let's just do our own thing then. 
You see, how funny it is, the enemy works to prey on the weak. To prey on those who feel like they have fallen. To prey on those who feel like they lost the debate. You see, we often create our Christian walk in our minds as a debate between God and Satan. And it can be true to some degree. That yeah, yeah, there, is, there is a spiritual warfare taking place for your soul. Absolutely. But let me remind you brothers here who are struggling. It's not a debate. He won the victory. He paid the price on the cross. You're set free. So let me remind you, it isn't a debate. Jesus won. See, but the enemy comes along and creates this scenario. Oh, and we start to feel convicted, you know. We start to feel like, oh, I lost, man. I messed up again. Oh, gosh, I knew I was going to mess up again. I'm horrible and lousy. You're right, Satan. I can't do this anymore. I can't be a Christian. I can't bring back my joy. I can't bring back my walk. I can't get back in ministry. And Satan's going, that's right. You can't. You can't. You can't. Jesus is like, what are you talking about? I already paid all that. I already did all that for you. For when you are weak, I am made strong. Don't you remember me saying that? So Satan, when you're at that moment of feeling like you messed up and you failed and you can't do it, he looks at you and says, Go to your own tent, O Israel. Forget this debate thing. How about withdraw yourself from the walk that you're so divided over? Oh, man, isn't it lousy fighting yourself in the mind? God, I can't do it. Yes, I can. No, I can't. Don't you're tired of it? Go to your own tent. Give this thing up. You ain't got no part in David. You ain't got no part in Jesus. Let it go. How often do we take the bite of that, that lie? You know, he's right. I can't do it, man. I, I, I've tried for years now, and I just can't seem to get it down. I'm just going to go back to doing my own thing. I'm going to go back to my own tent. Because he's enticing you to do so. He's, he's camping on the fact that you have a weak spot. Let, let, me, let me just inform you, brothers. We all have weak spots. And they ain't going anywhere. They're going to be there in our lives until the day we die. <laughs> or go home to be with the Lord. But the one thing we can't allow is we can't allow ourselves to believe the lie that it's up to you to redeem yourself. You see, because it's not up to you to redeem yourself. If it was up to you to redeem yourself, then none of us would be sitting in right now. See, he redeemed us. He set us free. So then the question is, are we walking in his victory or are we walking in our own victory? Because if we're walking in our own victory, then that ever debate is always going to be before you. And you're always going to lose it. You have to begin to learn how to point back at your mind and that debate and the enemy when he's being a Sheba at your, at your spiritual thinking. You have to turn right back around and say, hey, I'm hidden in Christ Jesus like Colossians 3.3 says. So when I look in the mirror, hopefully I see the Lord. Not myself. Because I already know if I see myself in the mirror, I'm doomed. I'm doomed for, for everything. Failure, I'm doomed to fail, lose everything. You see, but this comes on, guys, real subtle, doesn't it? It comes on very subtle-like. It comes on in a real kind of like quiet mode. You start to take, you, you, get, you take these steps of being filled with this type of Belial influence by partaking one step at a time in that negativity. You see, because this debate between Judah and Israel that we're reading about, it, it's, it, it has roots, man. And it, it only gets worse from here, to be honest with you. In case you guys, all of us have read our Bibles, we know what ends up happening with Israel and Judah. We know of the division that the kingdom faces in the future. It, it just, it's just the beginning, you see. So we need, to, we need to quench it and understand it now. In our own lives, now. If you're a negative, you know, ball of doubt and grouchiness, you need to get over yourself. Because all you're going to do is bring yourself down even further to a place where you're living in your own tent again. You see, you have to realize that if you want your joy back restored, you got you to stop striving. Okay? And you got to get back to resting in Him. He says, if you want to labor for something, then labor to rest. That's what he says. Don't labor to sweat and glory and bleed because he already did that. We labor to rest. 
to rest in the work that he did on the cross. And that's it. And if you're a man in here tonight who's resting in the Lord, then you know what? You're at peace. Yeah, you go through warfare. Hey, we all do. Yeah, you go through the ups and downs of things. Sure. Yeah, you might have doubt because every one of us is going to. But you don't let it bring you down and rip you apart to where you're just nothing but a ball of negativity and you're a Sheba. You don't let it get you that far. Because you stop yourself and you go, whoa, whoa, I've been here and done that. I must be in the flesh right now. <laughs> I must be getting, getting caught up in my own parade here. You know, it's time to throw that towel in and get back to deliverance and get back to salvation and get back to my first love. But Israel right now in our scripture is not there. They lost the debate. They're all hurt inside. And then they hear the trumpet blown and their heads look. And there's Sheba going, hey, forget David. And they're like, yeah, forget him, man. We just love him, man. And then there they go to Sheba. It says in verse 2, so every man of Israel, every one of them, okay, went up from after David and followed Sheba. <laughs> these guys, man. They, they, what is up with these dudes? Did we read these stories and go, are you guys kidding me? Come on, man. Your king just came back to the palace. He's being restored. Don't you see the hand of God on him? And you're going to get all mad because you lost the debate on who knows him and loves him more. And now you get one guy over here blowing a shofar and enticing you and dividing you. And you don't see that he's of the enemy. And you're going to just go follow him and let go of your king. But how often do we do that too? Do we not see the enemy enticing us? Do we not see the lure? You don't recognize it? Then recognize it now. Hear it now. Hear the lure. You're being lured into division. You're being lured into following after yourself. You're being lured away from Jesus. If your eyes are on Sheba. If your eyes are on the one who is appeasing your flesh. If your attention is drawn towards the man or towards the woman or towards the person or towards the entity or job, whatever it might be, if your eyes are being drawn towards that because it appeases your agenda, then you're going in the wrong direction. If you're quarreling in your mind with God and saying, this is just not what I want. Lord, I don't understand why you want me here. I don't understand what you're doing in my life. I don't understand why I'm here. And then you go towards somebody who says, hey, come over here. This is where you need to be. And you go, yeah, that's where I want to be. Because where God has for me, I don't understand and I don't get it. I don't like it. But I'm going to go over there. Guess what? You're going to Sheba. If that's where you're going, that's where you're going. You're going to Sheba. You're being enticed. You're being lured in by, to somebody who is interrogating you and their purposes. They're worthless. They're useless. And it's meant for your destruction. That's the warning. That's what the scripture is teaching us tonight. Do we recognize the Sheba or not? Because if you don't, Brother, I'll pray for you. If you don't hear it tonight, that this is a characteristic of the enemy, and you're just justifying it, well, you don't even know, man, I'm just tired. Well, okay. If you're being enticed to go after something that appeases your agenda, that appeases your motive, then you're following after Sheba, who is filled with the spirit of Belial. And you're going to end down a worthless road, man. You see, God is faithful. He's faithful to warn us. He's faithful to show us. He's faithful to, to say, hey, be careful. Turn. Go back to the road of the valley of the shadow of death. It's okay. I know you may not see the end. I know it may be strenuous on your flesh. Indeed, it's strenuous on your flesh. But know that you will walk through the valley of shadow of death and you will fear no evil and you'll turn back and you'll see that you walked through it. You see, God will take us there, man. He'll take us there when we don't see it. Gosh, how amazing it must look in the spiritual realm, our lives. Probably so many of us in this room are following on the path that God has for us. And that would mean that every single one of us that is doing that, we're, we're, all, we're all messed up. We're tired. You're, you're, you're tripping sometimes. You're going, oh, man, but you know what? You're not stopping. You, those of you who recognize, no, I'm not going to go down that one because I've been down there, and I know that's not what God has for me. 
And those of you who are on that fight, on that battle, then stand firm, man. And seek and labor to rest in the Lord because he's taking you through the valley of the shadow of death. That's where you're at. But now, some of us are at the crossroads. And we're still debating in our mind, do we want this or not? Do I want to be a part? Do I want to accept the lot that God has given me or not? And you have a choice to make. You got Sheba blowing the trumpet over here saying, come on, follow me. Go back to doing your own thing in your own tent. And then you have your king over here with his hands reaching out saying, follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. We get to choose, man. And David standing back, watching all this go down. Man. He says in verse 3, David came to his house at Jerusalem, probably so weary. Finally got home. Probably didn't want to. Didn't want, he probably saw his house and just spit on the ground. You know, you think he's restored, man. He'd be celebrating. You remember one time he danced naked back into the place. You think he would go and grab the ark and give it a hug. I'm back, God. Oh, he just goes in his house. And everybody split. She was making all kinds of noise. And, and the king took the ten women of his, his concubines, which you guys remember what happened to them, right? Saw Absalom, his son, had them all on the roof, and he had all of them to shame his father. And he gets home, and it says, whom he had left to keep the house, and he put him in a ward. He fed him and everything, and he went not unto them. He never touched them again. And so they were shut up unto the day of their death, living in widowhood. He's going back to defilement. He's going back to things just being not the way they once were. Isn't it funny sometimes when restoration comes to us in our lives? Some of us get saved. We come back. Uh, we start following after God. He brings us back to the place he's called us. Not everything's the same as it used to be. Not everything's going to be the exact same. Life goes on. Life changes. But that doesn't mean that we need to turn back around and say, it's not the way it used to be. I don't like this anymore. We just need to say, this is the lot that God has for me. This is the way my life has ended up. It's only down here on earth. One day I'm going to be before the Lord in all eternity. Then said the king to Amasa, which is his nephew, Assemble me the men of Judah within three days, and be thou here present. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he tarried longer than the set time which he had appointed him. So the guy who he has in his command, he's shady. Everybody's falter. And David said to Abishai, verse 6, Now shall Sheba, the son of Bikridu, do us more harm, now watch this, than did Absalom. You see, David is seeing what's happening in front of him. He's seeing his commander, shady, barely no obedience. He's seeing what happened with his concubines. He's seeing all of these things, and he's seeing now, and he's realizing this Sheba, this, this useless, worthless, antagonizing man is going to cause a lot more harm than even Absalom did. He's going to be that much more of a problem to me. You see, David is realizing something that I think all of us should realize at this moment. That it is so much more dangerous to follow after someone that or something that is has this spiritual influence behind it that's bringing you down the drain, that's bringing you down into a place of discouragement and dissension and division. It's more dangerous to be divided. We have to really pray. We have to really gain this understanding tonight that it is unity that we should be fighting for. It is unity that we should be praying for. It is unity within our family, unity within the marriage, unity within the brothers, unity within the ministry. If you're at a place of division in the ministry, you either need to step down or you need to confess. If you're at a place in your marriage where you're at a place of division and no unity exists, then you need to go to marriage counseling. Okay? If you're at a place where you are just double-minded, then you need to share with the brothers in your prayer for healing and restoration. Because dissension and division could be more worse to you than anything you've ever imagined as a Christian. 
As soon as you become somebody who's divided from within, the Bible says, a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. Brothers, you won't stand if you're divided. And Satan knows that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, I just pray right now. Lord, I just, even for, for myself and for all the brothers in here, Lord, that you would please bring us to a place of confession. Bring us to a place of realizing um, where we, if we've gone down that road of following after that trumpet, that Sheba, that divisive, antagonizing agenda, Lord, forgive us. Bring us back on the right track. And I want to take this moment of prayer with everybody praying. If any of you brothers in here and, and I just feel like this is something the Lord is wanting us to do. Um, feel like you have found yourself in this place, whether it's in your ministry, if it's in your marriage, if it's in your life, it's in, if it's in your fellowship, where you're, you're a person who is either like Sheba <laughs> or following after a Sheba, uh, that this would be a time I want to pray for you uh, if you just want to get back on the right track. Basically confess. Get back to your first love. If you're a brother in here that's going through that tonight, I want to pray for you. And if you are, and if the Lord's prompting on your heart, just raise your hand. God bless you. Bless you. So many of you, brothers. God bless you guys. Everybody that's raising their hand. God sees your hand. And he knows what you're confessing. He knows what you're saying because you've seen yourself as we are reading his word. It's his word that brings life and life. And as we've been reading, you've seen yourself a little bit in there. And God hears your prayer. And he sees your hands. And he's going to bring about restoration too. And he's going to, and he's going to get, wash away that divisiveness. He's going to wash away that feeling of just being so split. You know, That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do. God bless you. God bless you guys with your hands up. Anybody else that the Lord might be speaking to? And again, it's not me. It's the Lord speaking to you. My encouragement to you is to respond to him. God bless you, brother. He's God. He knows you. Even the secret things of your heart, he knows. <laughs> Even if we don't, he does. God bless you. So, Father, I just pray alongside with my brothers who have, are confessing to you that they have found themselves in this place. So many brothers. But Lord, that means so many brothers now are going to walk out of here strong. They're going to walk out of here tonight changed because they've realized and then acknowledged where they're at because of your word. And so Lord, I just pray for them that you would strengthen them, that you would continue to give them encouragement. Lord, that you would spark them back up, bring back joy, that joy of their salvation, that joy of fellowship and ministry and of living and of life that you have for all of us. Bring it back to them, Lord. I pray as the enemy is going to continue to try to attack them, that you would shield them, Lord. Be their shield, as your word says. So, Lord, I just pray for the rest of the night tonight, as we continue to be in our groups, and as we fellowship with one another, that we would strengthen and encourage each other and unite one another. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you guys.